Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to worship. We are grateful that you are joining us. Just one announcement to be aware of during the season of Advent, which starts at the last Sunday of November, we're going to start a sermon series on Christmas in the movies. And so we're going to be looking at some of our favorite Christmas movies and talking about the lessons that we can find both with them and parallel to Scripture. So if you have a favorite movie, you are welcome to go to our Facebook page and uh, suggest that or just contact me directly. Again, welcome to worship. We're grateful that you're joining us. Let's start with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks on this glorious day for the opportunity to gather. We pray that your blessing would fall upon all those who are, who are hearing your word this day. Remind us again and again of your sacrifice, of your love, and of your forgiveness. And help us to demonstrate these things in all that we do and all that we say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One, two, three. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.
The good news comes to us from Mark's Gospel, the 15th chapter. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lamai, Sabatani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard this, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. There was also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger and of Joseph and Salome. They used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come with him to Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It really should be the most sacred holy place in all of the world. For 1,600 years, many church bodies have said this is the actual place of the crucifixion. This is the actual hill where Jesus died. This is Golgotha right here. And there's a, a church that's built around it, also where the tomb uh, is supposed to be. There's a church called the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And like I said, it should be the most sacred holy place in all the world. And yet it is just a holy mess. It's pretty awful. It's a disaster. Now, admittedly, when I visited there 25 years ago, I was on a college trip. We did it the second day we were there. There was some jet lag. We'd been traveling around Jerusalem by foot all day long. It was amazing, but it was also weird. I was exhausted. I walked in there exhausted, ready for just a rest. So I, I went in with a bad attitude, but even outside of that, the place is just a disaster. Uh, you walk in and it was full of, of tourists when we first got there. I mean, just elbow to elbow with tourists. Every single group had their own guide. They were all just trying to shout over each other. They had these giant, you know, high ceilings. And so everything was echoing around. It was just this cacophony. And then you go up and they take you first to go with us. So there you are, you're in the spot where at least some churches have said for 600 years that this is the spot where Jesus died. And it was like a, a toddler had a glue stick and some glitter, right? It was just this garish, gaudy mess. I mean, any surface they could find, they just slapped gold on it. And if otherwise they they're, can cover it in a window first and then slap gold around and then put a jewel right in the middle. I mean, it was... It was, there was no sense to it. There was no pattern. It was just loud and bright and shiny and awful. There was nothing that felt sacred or holy about it at all. And then they take us to the tomb. And at least the hill of Golgotha, at least that place, you could argue that that really was where Jesus' crucifixion was. There was, there was a case you could make for that. Not super likely, but there's a case you could make for that. The tomb that they take you to, there is no way that this is the tomb. I mean, it was clearly built in the last thousand years. I mean, it just was not something that was built in first century Palestine. It was obviously not the tomb, but it's like we were all supposed to pretend it was the tomb. It's a little bit like going to a theme park. Like you go to Disney World, you see, you see Goofy. You know that's not really Goofy. That's an actor playing Goofy, but it's fun to pretend it's Goofy. It was sort of that feeling of like we're all supposed to just pretend that this is the actual tomb and you wait in this long line and finally you step into this tomb. It's like... It's like a theme park. It was really not at all sacred, not at all holy, and it felt pretty, pretty awful. And that's not even the worst part. The worst part is that this space is controlled by five different church bodies. The Roman Catholics, Greek Orthodox, Ethiopian Orthodox, Coptics, and Armenian, I believe. I could get those wrong. But they have been arguing over this space. They've been fighting, sometimes violently, over this space for hundreds of years. Now, finally, about 150 years ago, they've made some sort of peace but it's still, we, the place is falling apart because the two groups, at least it was 25 years ago, maybe it's gotten better, but the two groups, or the five different groups, no two group can agree. And so there'll be scaffolding around some much needed repairs and it'll sit there for decades because one church will start the needed repairs and another church group will come up and say, you can't do that, that's our space. And they will argue about it for a generation. It is so bad that not one of these five churches holds the key because nobody wants any of the other churches to have that power. So the key is held by a Muslim family that's held it for a few generations that live nearby. 
No, it's, it is just disastrous. It is messy, and I honestly loved it. I really did. It was my favorite spot in all of Jerusalem. I went back again and again. I mean, part of why I loved it is the metaphor. It is a perfect metaphor for why Jesus died for us. Listen, Jesus did not come onto this earth and die on a cross because we're nice. He didn't do it because we got our stuff all figured out. He didn't do it because our kids are all attractive and well-behaved and sometimes get varsity playing time. Jesus didn't come because we got our lawns nicely manicured and all of our leaves picked up. Jesus didn't come because we're friendly, even in the morning, even before we have our coffee. No, no. It, the, the Holy Sepulchre, in all of its messiness, in all of its chaos, it proclaims the deepest, most beautiful truth about our faith. I mean, at the very heart of what we believe is just perfectly encapsulated by this, by this messy, broken space. Because Jesus came and he, he emptied himself and he became human and he died on a cross because of brokenness. I mean, those monks and priests at the Holy Sepulchre, they're not awful people. They're not wicked. They're not evil. This isn't, you know, war crimes. This isn't murder. This is just the ordinary human frailty. It's, it's ordinary failings. It's everyday stuff. The passive aggressive things when your neighbor just kind of annoys you and so you annoy the neighbor back and it just kind of gets not awful, just unpleasant. It's just human beings in all of their just broken messiness, taking something beautiful and twisting it into something dark, and God loving us so much that even though this is who we are in a fundamental level, it, it's the human nature to take beautiful gifts of God and twist them into something ugly, God still comes onto this earth and lives and dies out of this just <laughs> incredible love for you. I mean, it, it blows my mind. I mean, the beautiful truth of what God has done for us. The creator of all the universe to love us so much that he died on a cross for us. So I do, I love the Holy Sepulchre because it just, it, it preaches that gospel in this really concrete, real world way. But I also love it because I went back a couple days later and a few times after that. My wife and I both did. And when all the tourists are gone, we went in the morning before a lot of people showed up. It becomes really quite beautiful. I and mean, it's still broken and it's still falling apart. It's still garish in different ways. They've got gold slapped up in places that make no sense. But it's also filled with these deeply faithful people just in this broken space trying to worship their God. We'd walk around a corner. I mean, it was just a maze. You'd walk around a corner and there'd be this, this incline, decline down into a, a, like a grotto. And down there, you'd find these monks, these Greek monks, dressed in these beautiful robes, chanting. And the, the sound would just echo in this beautiful way all around the space. And then you'd go around another corner, and there would be this group from, I don't know, Mississippi, this Baptist group, holding hands and singing, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And it would, you know, just echo in this space. And then at one point, Lars and I went up these stairs, and I don't even know if we were supposed to go up there. We, we may have taken a wrong turn, but we, we walked into this little chapel. And I believe it was a Coptics or Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And it was just 12 monks dressed very simply. And they had these staffs, these wooden staffs with hooks. And they were having a worship together. We couldn't understand a word that they said. I am sure that the tourists annoyed them to no end. But still, they were so warm and so welcoming. And they just, they just invited us to sit with them. And so we did. And we, we sat and worshiped for, it wasn't a long service, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. At some point, they gave us a glass of water to drink. We had no idea what was going on, but we, we drank the water. It felt, it felt sacred. It felt holy. It felt warm. It felt inviting. Oh, it, it was a beautiful space because it shows how we do take the beautiful things of God and twist them into something ugly. But even more powerfully, God takes our brokenness and transforms it into something beautiful. This is the, the promise, the beauty of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem, but much more so, it is the promise and the beauty of the cross itself. This is why we keep showing up, at least why I do, because of that promise in the cross that we're broken, absolutely, we are a mess, 
But no matter how broken, God, God still loves us all the way to the cross. And still, no matter how broken, God transforms our sin, transforms our faults, transforms our darkness into God's marvelous light. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We would like to thank everyone for the financial support you have given to United Lutheran Church here in Red Wing. The options in giving are to text and go on the mail at on the, uh, to the church or go to our website. The fourth choice is come and worship with us. We have a wonderful staff here, a great congregation with lots of activities. So come and be a part of our faith journey. Blessings to you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Almighty and ever-living God, we give you thanks for the veterans who have served our country and defended the values that we hold dear. Help us be mindful of the sacrifices they made and the hardship endured by their families and friends. Hear us, we pray, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We pray for our teachers, administrators, and students that they find joy in learning and teaching. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for the hands that prepared these quilts, and we ask for your blessing upon those who will receive them. We ask that you warm their bodies, of course, but also that their spirits may be warmed by the hope and promise of your presence and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the natural wonders of your creation, restore damages, forests, waterways, and natural habitats. Lead us to be good stewards of the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we pray for these members of our church who are experiencing health concerns this week. We pray for Dorothy Gentry, Peggy Olson, Mary Stenslin, and Sylvester Rottering. Please bless them with health and with strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God be in your hearts. The grace of God be in your words. The love of God be in your hands. The joy of God be in your soul and in the song that your life sings. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. amen.